computer. Okay, Nathan Simon, All Properties Group. How are you, mate? Thanks for joining yeah, us. Good, man. Good. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. My pleasure. How's business for you at the moment? Keeping busy? Things going well? Yeah, look, the market's a bit different. Every every micro sector, I'm sure everyone knows, is a bit different at the moment. But overall, good buyer activity. Not enough stock, which I'm sure you'll hear multiple times. But that's an issue that uh, will fix itself pretty quick, I think. Yeah, awesome. So, mate, let's learn about Nathan Simon to begin with. Obviously, uh, let's start with a bit of a background or a bit of an intro on, on you, if you could. I know the agenda for, for this topic or this this podcast style is obviously trying to uh, connect with agents under 30 who are kicking some good goals. So, mate, let's start with um, probably a couple of ones. Number one, your age, time in the industry, and and maybe your level of uh, GCI you're writing at the moment. Yeah, well, so I'm 26, 27 in about four weeks' time, so... Um, well below 30 I'll keep saying well below 30 and when I hit 30 I won't go any higher so we'll stick to that cool. but so I've had an interesting run in real estate in in my past so I actually jumped straight into real estate at 18 so just turned 18 I uh, attempted university I dropped out of school I um, I tried a few different things tried to get in the defense force and nothing really worked out and I went to university to do a um, a diploma and then was going to go into bachelor of commerce specializing in real estate back then I Believe it or not, I didn't even Google real estate agents. So I had no idea that you could just become a real estate agent by going down to Southport and spending three days in a classroom. So uh, six months in, I was hating life and I literally Googled how to become a real estate agent and saw the license course and quit university and off I went. Uh, back then, I joined a business in um, in Waterford or Kingston, it was, uh, as a, what was called a home finder for a Genman agency back in the day. Home finders, that's one. I haven't heard that for a long time. I actually started in a Genman agency myself. So yeah. home finder is a term that I haven't heard in a long time. A lot of people won't hear it because there's not many of them left. Yeah. Uh, and, and I experienced why very quickly. So, But I was, uh, I was a baby-faced, just-turned-18-year-old. Genuinely, I was walking up to people and they thought I was someone's kid and I was lost. Um, walking through the streets of Kingston and getting chased by dogs. And it was just a wild experience. And I sat down with the principal at the time and I said, look, I, I'm better than this. Like I need, I want to learn how to list. I want to go to open homes. I want to do stuff. I want to earn at the time. I was like, I want to earn a hundred grand. It was like my goal. And he sat me down. He said, you know what? If you can bring 100 listing, listings in this year, I'll pay you a hundred thousand dollar salary. And I kind of walked out of the office and I was like, yeah, 100 listings, easy peasy, whatever. And I sat down in my office and I was like, 100 listings for 100 grand. I did the calculations. It's like, there's no way I can, I can be here anymore. And I just started applying for jobs, ended up working for one of the top agents as an assistant after that down the Gold Coast, um, which was another interesting experience from there. I got too big for my own boots. I thought I was, thought I was, you know, high level. I wanted to be my own agents and three months later and he kicked me out of his team and said, you know what, off you go then have a crack. And probably one of the biggest mistakes I made, to be honest with you in real estate mm -hmm. was not sitting back and taking it all in and, and just learning at the time and went out as a solo agent for six months and went broke, to be honest with you. I uh, was sitting in people's land rooms and they were like looking at me being like, where are your parents? Um, I was living at home with my parents, never rented a house, let alone owned a home. I was trying to give people advice on how to sell their biggest asset. And it just wasn't going well for me, to be quite honest. So I left, um, left the industry, spent six years out of, became the number one um, used car salesman uh, in Queensland for quite some time, became a sales manager, traveled the world, now got two kids, bought, renovated, invested, had rental properties. And, and then I got a normal nine to five job when I had my first child in um, account management and sales in the construction industry. And I was, Bored shitless, to be honest with you. Excuse my French, but I was just nah, go for it. numbing nine to five, Monday to Friday. And I just felt like I was just cruising along in life and it was doing my head in. And uh, I sat down with my wife and I said, like, I can't do this. Like, I miss real estate. I miss that grind, that hustle uh, to, to push myself. And so I did my online course, got my full license. I created branding and everything. I was going to start um, a side hustle in real estate. And open up my I've own heard that before. Yeah, open up my own office. And then I um I saw an advert from Chris Gilmore, the, the owner of All Properties Group, and he was looking for a buyer's manager. And uh, this was two and a half years ago now. And I was like, God, I have a lot of respect for this guy. I've stayed in touch with him for what at the time was probably eight years. I'll reach out. And he got me in for an interview. And uh, I sat down and told me the role. And I, I kind of just went, 
if I'm going to do this, I can't work for someone else. Like I can't, I can't mm. sit here and, and not use the, the now skills that I've built over the last six years in sales go to waste. And I left the interview and I messaged him that night and I said, Matt, I can't do it. How about you let me have a crack on the side? I'm fully licensed. I'll contract to you guys. I'll work Monday to Friday, nine till five in my normal job. And I'll sell houses at night and on the weekends. And he went, all right, have a go. So I did. And I spent, it would have been six months, sold seven houses. I was working nine to five. And part of my job was traveling out into far west regions of Queensland to sell construction equipment. And I was selling selling blocks of land. I was selling houses on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, wow. Right out of signal every half an hour. I'd find some signal again. I'd pull over. I'd prospect. I'd make, I'd answer phone calls, respond to emails from inquiries. And this was like when COVID had just hit. So one of the best markets ever, which I didn't realize until I put a property online and I was getting 50 emails in a day. Just wild. So August, 2021, I quit my job full-time, bought a car uh, and joined the business officially as a full-time agent. At that time, I'd sold seven houses and they were all settling. So I had a bit of cash behind me. And that first financial year, so from August when I started to June 30 the next year, I did 300000 in GCI. Then I hired two staff members, went through a bit of turmoil, but wrote just shy of 800000 this financial year gone. Uh, and I'm on track to do around one to $1.2 million this this financial year coming. Wow, awesome. That's a pretty fast progression, right? So 300 first year, is that right? Yeah. 300 first yeah. year. Was that first year of being full time, or were you still first year being full time? Yeah, so that was gotcha. from August twenty twenty one to June twenty twenty two. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, so what uh, did you have a level in mind? You mentioned your team there for a moment as well. So let's bring team members into it uh, quickly. How big's your team now? Is it just you and one other, or have you got three? So I've got me and two others. Great. And what roles do they play? So I've got an associate agent. So he works beside me. He does predominantly buyer work um, and all the the non-dollar productive buyer stuff um, and also photography, things like that, that I shouldn't be doing. And he also does a lot of the door knocking. He's very good at that. Uh, and then I've got my sister-in-law who's technically my executive assistant and then a full-time marketer. She's got a degree in graphic design. So awesome. all of my social media, uh, all the print advertising and all the paperwork side is all run by her full-time. Great. Excellent. Okay. And when, at what stage? So you mentioned, so you did 300 solo and then put your first assistant on. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And did you have, did you have a, uh, an inkling in the back of your mind about what level uh, to put on an assistant and, or did it kind of just come naturally? Something the right person presented themselves and, well, and the rest is history. With you, the, the whole company uh, about 18 months ago went through a shift where we all wanted to, get rid of this whole mass agent mindset that most people have where we just had heaps of agents doing small numbers and we wanted to create teams, right? So everyone in, in all properties group, almost everyone anyway, has a team of people except for the new, the new agents to the industry. And so we had some other agents that were not necessarily strong at listing at the time. Ah. And look, to be fair, I, I made a big mistake, a big error here, but I, I hired two straight away, right? So I did two at the same time. I hired someone who... Uh, I got along with really well within the office, was not very good at listing, but, you know, was really good with buyer management. And then I had Chloe from, from the get-go, who's my executive assistant, and she's been fantastic. She's been with me since that moment. But I made a big error with who I hired, right, because, you know, I think it was four months in, uh, things weren't getting done. I was getting complaints from people that, you know, I was getting her to do open homes, and there was no signage out. She was just standing there doing nothing. And all this sort of stuff came mm. through. And then I found out that there was a lot of lying and, and things that happened. And, look, you know, I, it was a very interesting learning curve for me because three months in and, you know, I I basically went full steam ahead on the team and made a big error with just handing everything over and not stepping it into it. And, uh, you know, ended up on my own for another few months. And uh, the, the person who's with me now, I, I kind of feel for him, but, it uh, made it quite hard for me to hire someone again. And I think everyone's going to go through this, but when you have turmoil and some of the things that happens were not good, right, towards my business, uh, it was a struggle to hire. I actually rejected my current associate four times, <laughs> four interviews, wow. and I told him four times, and he kept coming back. And that's, 
that's why he's in the role that he's in and that's why he's a part of my team. So what role, what is the, what is the day to day? look for the three of you now. Are you very regimented in, in what each of your disciplines are? I mean, are you just focusing on, um, you know, hot conversions, getting, you know, contracts done, getting uh, buyers to contract and then ultimately getting uh, listings signed or are you still doing some buyer inquiry? Where does, where does the, the roles fit in and where did you get clear on those roles uh, of each of your, your team? Yeah, so look, we're still in a, an interesting development phase. You know, I, I think the next jump for us to be above a million is is where things are going to really change. And, you know, we're going through that. We've actually, you know, there's some big things happening for us where if, if you don't know all properties group, but where the head office is in Logan, right? And I sell on the Gold Coast. So I've got no brand presence down here except for my team. That's about to change, right? So things are changing very quickly. But when it comes to what we do on a day-to-day basis, so my whole role, what, what I specialize is, is negotiations, finding business, hunting for business and listings, right? That's, I still do the occasional admin job if I have to, if things are just too much. Um, mm. You know, those sort of things still happen, but my focus is prospecting, listing, selling, right? When it comes to inquiries that now is taken care of, I was very big on not handing things over. It took a long time for Kerry to be, after what happens, to take on a lot of, a lot of roles, but he now handles everything to with buyers, um, which is fantastic. So all day he spends either running buyers or he's calling our whole database and servicing buyers. We get a lot of comments um, because of him that, that that we actually follow up, which is quite important, I think, in this industry that people know that we actually care and we're trying to find them stuff. And if he start, finds someone that is hot and they need to go, that's when I come into play and try and find them something and I can try and match off-market deals from there. And is there a, just quickly, is, is there a reverse prospecting element in what he does with those buyers or is it purely sell them a property, find them a house and not focus too much about what what their listing circumstances are? No, so he's, he's got a KPI around <clears throat> bringing appraisals from those and he's Great. advised to bring appraisals and listings in, um, which, you know, is a lot more serious now. In the beginning, it was all about training and getting him ready for buyers management. Now it's more so... How do we convert those to listings, which he's doing a fantastic job of now? Uh, is there a number of average, so to interrupt you there? Is there an average number number of touch points that he has with a buyer? Let's say, for example, a buyer owns a property. They he's identified that they may want an appraisal at some point down the track. Is he is he got a certain amount of touch points of trying to build trust and trying to find the property for them before he engages with the appraisal conversation? Or if the doors open, he goes for it? Yeah. So. This is a two-pronged approach. So if he's identified that they've got a property that they need to sell, he's trying to get me in the door. And then we're, we're staying in touch. So we have to stay in touch with that buyer every single week and find out how close they are and trying to send them. We're sending them properties from other agents. We're just servicing right. them as best as we can. And if it looks like they're close to buying something, that's when I come on board, right? They turn into a seller lead rather than a buyer lead. And I start to nurture and make sure that they're getting correct information on their property, if he hasn't gotten him in the door, then I'll try and get me in the door. And that's kind of, it's a really good dynamic um, with that. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Okay. And we're, so let's talk about the three, 300K to 800K. That's a big jump, right? A huge jump in, 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 in any time of year or any market that we're in. What was the key change, you think, from, from that year? Or was it purely just so much horsepower in that first year that it eventually just flowed on to the second year? Yeah, look, I think it was a matter of that first year was the building year. And I, I've spent that whole first 12 months focusing on the future business, right? So the most of the listings I got in my first year were expires, right? That's how I got, got started, door knocks and some of the brochures that I did. But otherwise, it was mainly from expires. And then through that in between, I was building a database of people and nurturing them, right? That's that's one of my main roles is nurturing the current people in the database to get them ready. And I think we just got a really good amount of momentum. But the other thing I did was just increase my price point. So I went from that first year, I think I averaged a sale price around 800,000, that $800,000 GCI, my average sale price was 1.2 million, right? Which was semi market focused, but also the areas that I was focusing on. Uh, And, you know, I haven't had that, niche down to a suburb necessarily right i've also niche down to a price now and that's right. probably been the biggest the biggest thing being able to prospect in a lot in a wider bay rather than a semi-focused area um that's been interesting but i think 
I, you know, I'm very community eccentric and I think that's now starting to pay off. So I, I went out in my first year and every single cent I made, I reinvested, right? So I sponsored every local sporting team, Love every that. local events. I put on my own events um, with fireworks and stuff like that at Christmas, which I'm doing again very soon um, for my second year. And I think that memory stuck with people, right? And it just kind of flowed from there. So where does the majority of your business come from now? Let's let's talk about the 800 and, and 800 year to sort of even this year. What's Are you still doing a lot of database work now or is it mainly coming from repeat referrals and, and a lot of that community involvement you're doing? Let's get, let's run through that pretty quickly. Yeah. So still, and look, I'm not, I'm not an attraction business yet. So 50% of my business is still from outgoing calls, right? 50% is cold calls, fresh leads, right? That I'm out there chasing and Carrie's chasing through the doorknobs. It's about 25 to 30% approximately is from the nurturing, from the database directly. So people that I've been in contact with 6, 12, 18, 24 months of work have finally just paid off. And then the rest that's there is a mixture of open homes and buyer work. And then we've got the occasional referral repeat business. But we're still, we're only two years in technically mm. right at the moment. So we're very outbound lead focused right now. We're, and we can't stop that yet yeah. until it obviously starts coming in. And does marketing play a, a role in that as well? And if so, online, offline, what are your strategies there? Yeah, so look, uh, marketing's been an interesting point. I've always been social media eccentric, right? That's where I've started. That's where I always invested the most amount of money, but I let a lot of other people influence me for the last two years or well, before I, I, I really started to take off in the last six months. And I spent a lot of money on letterbox drops only to find that they were being dumped. And I tried four different companies spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to get into people's letterboxes and it was just not working, right? I tried everything to do it. And so we no longer do, we do um, direct mail, but we don't do letterbox drops anymore. Right? So we don't pay for DLs. We don't do any of that sort of stuff because I just found that one, everyone's doing it. Uh, and two, it was hard to get people that would genuinely do the right thing by us, right? And do it properly. And we tried the top, right? Australia Post themselves. We had mm. them and that was still getting dumped. I also tried bus advertising and, you know, I spend a lot of money on things now that I look back, that was a total waste of money, but you live and you learn. So my main strategy now is social media and community focused advertising, right? I still sponsor everything, everything. Yeah. Locally. So, and we use that through social media then as well. So kind of it's this circle roundabout sort of way. Is there a margin on the on your marketing and community? Are you putting community involvement into the marketing category? Just quickly, is that is that a yeah. part of the budget? Okay, so is there a is there a margin off each sale? Is there a margin from your total GCI that you're you're reinvesting, or is it just going the money's there? We can afford to do it. Let's just do it, and it'll pay off yeah. down the track. Yeah, the way, look the way that I look at it, and and look, I'm I'm in the early stages, right? So yes, I want to make profit, but I want to have a long term sustainable business. So right now, I'm just reinvesting, right? Every cent that I get that outside of paying the normal wages and all yep. that sort of stuff is reinvested. Um, so I don't necessarily have a set amount of money. It is if I see the money's there and there's an opportunity that. You know, like this, for example, this event that I'm putting on at Christmas, right? I've got 800 people set to come um, and we've still got six weeks left of marketing. So I should have a thousand people from my local community there. Um, so that's about a $10,000 event, right? That's less than one listing. Right? Mm. So if I get one person from a thousand people in my local direct for itself. Community, it pays itself off and then hopefully it flows into next year. That's the way that I look at it. I go for the $10,000 investment, I only have to sell one house to pay for it. Right. So that's the way that I look at it. Maybe, you know, early days, later on that might change. But right now it's just invest, invest, invest. What is the event out of curiosity? And what do you do to get so many people hooked into that? Yeah. So I came up with the idea last year, last Christmas, that I kind of wanted to do something that people would remember. So I put on a movie in the park. So I hired out, which anyone that's dealt with the Gold Coast Council, it's not easy. It's very expensive. But I've hired out a whole Gold Coast park. Uh, so we've got a big movie screen. Last year we did Elf. This year we've got the Polar Express um, for it, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've got food trucks coming. Uh, we've got fireworks at the ends. Uh, we've got everything, live music, face painting. Santa's making an appearance in person. I've just gone nuts, right? And 
the way that I got it out to people initially was I'm a part of all the local community groups. I live in the area that I sell a fair bit of property. So I just shared it in there and said, hey, this is free. If you want to come along, come along. All right. Then I put it on Eventbrite as a data collection part of things. And I got right. people free tickets. And, you know, last year was only 300 people that came. This year, 800 tickets have already been allocated. 500 were sold in the first hour. So allocated, right? Yeah, yep. And then people just tell everyone we've got sponsors on board. So a lot of local businesses, we um, prospected them to say, hey, would you like to jump on board and support us? So they're sharing it. Uh, yeah, that's kind of just how it's all worked. And for us, it's a prospecting tool, right? So mm. we get, just like you do in a cinema, we get a cinema advert before it kicks off. Where the naming rights sponsor, so the whole, you know, the count we're on the council websites, everything's all properties groups, Christmas movie in the park. And I think the reason why I do it at Christmas is we've got three weeks, right? Usually that people just stop doing stuff, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Banks, like they all stop doing stuff. And that's three weeks that we can easily be forgotten. And I've gone, I don't want to be forgotten, right? I want people to finish Christmas and then go. I'm thinking of selling. Remember that guy that put on the free community event? The kids had so much fun. Remember all these photos? Genius. I want them to Genius. come back in January and go, let's call him. That's all I want. Yep. Love that, man. That's a that's a good one. And and funnily enough, I love the community involvement. Community involvement trumps any marketing, in my opinion. That's coming from a marketer myself. Community involvement, I love that. I mean, sporting teams and uh, charities and like that, like that one's even even that's gold. I've never heard an agent personally going that depth to the depth of, of what you've said there with the with the Christmas event. So I absolutely love that. Let's talk about what's next. So um, what's the next pivot now? So obviously 300, 800, The goal is one point two or projection. The goal 1. is one point two six. Yeah. Okay, great, the goal excellent. One point two six. And and what's 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 beyond that? I mean, do you want to grow the team more? Or you want to just sort of skill upskill the, the guys you've already got? What's the next focus for you? So I do. I am looking for another team member. So if there's anyone watching this, we are hiring. That is excellent. a lot harder, and I'm sure you've heard it's a lot harder than we expected it to be right now in this market to bring people onto a team. But we're working on it. But you know, I've I've got a goal, not necessarily to be a real estate agent selling forever right so the, the goal to be the number one agent doing hundreds of sales that's not mine right I, I actually have I really enjoy the training side and bringing on team and growth right? that growth is a big part so I'm getting to 1.2 million that's my goal because I know it's sustainable right and I can go once we get to 1.2 million the processes that we'll have in place at that point to sustain that to allow me to hire more to train more to build a business you know I, I will be opening an office very soon. Um, so we're not just here to play, like, to take part, right? We're here to mm. have a really good crack at the Northern Gold Coast. And um, that's the reason for the goal. But I just love growth, right? So when we sat down and we sit down every every three months, me and my team, our sales manager and go, hey, this is what we just did. What did we not like? What was not working? And what did we not do? And if we didn't do that, how do we do that now? Um, in the start, you know, the first... The first three months of this financial year, we sat down and went 300,000, great for our first year, but like, we've now got a full team, let's go, right? We're going to do this properly. And we sat down and went, well, this is what we're doing in prospecting, but we're not doing enough of this, this, we haven't got referral partners, let's fix all of that. And we break it down every three months into just focusing on things that that work. And do you hire for the, the, for the gaps that are in the business or do you plug them with good talent? I think that's the hardest thing that a lot of people struggle with them when they're building a team, do you hire for the, for what you're not good at or do you hire for just finding something who's who's going to fit your team, fit your culture and has just sheer, got the sheer work ethic to to, to fit well with where the direction you're going in? So I'm, I'm looking for culture, right? I think the real estate industry's got a terrible culture in general, right? The whole right. industry offices in general. And so when I'm building this office and I'm building my team, that's all I care about right now. So I've got a group hiring mentality for that reason, which probably makes it harder to hire. But I, you know, if I allocate a talent, find a talent that I think is good for the team, that the team gets a say, they get to meet them, um, both my team members and our sales manager to make sure there's not going to be that clash, right, mm. between because you can have a really skilled person in a great team, but if they don't like each other, it won't work, right? Yeah. No matter what. I've seen it in every industry I've been in, one bad egg can ruin an office. And that's more important to me. Right now, because we're struggling to find people, to be honest with you, 
it's actually been a matter of how much can I give out to allow me extra time. So, you know, with with the first issue that I had with hiring and, you know, they stole data and stole listings and all the, put out a lot of things through social media and stuff that was not good, I, I paired back and I didn't allow myself to let my staff members, the new members on the team, take a lot on quickly. And so it's taken me every three months we sit down and I literally say to them, what else can you take from me? And I, yeah, I'll try good call. I love like that. Out. What yeah. can you take? And, you know, every three months they're taking something different from each other and from me to make sure that we become more efficient, right? And that's efficiency is a big deal. I have a big push for work-life balance in this industry. You know, I've got two kids. My associate's got four kids, right? So we don't have You're this... busy. You're already busy, right? It's yeah, busy. exactly. So you need to be yeah, efficient. Yeah. yeah, efficiency over anything else. Oh, the one thing I really pulled up on what you said there, I picked out for what you said... And I love it because I think it's I think it might be Netflix who might do it, but hire for culture, train for skill, right? Whereas I think a lot of people these days do it the other way around. They hire for skill and then train for culture. But you've probably just in, in the twenty five minutes that we've been talking, you've already made it evidently clear that you can't train for culture. You got you've got to find something that's the right culture fit. And obviously, if other people once you've already built the team. Um, if there's clashes internally, then it just makes it a living hell from everyone. So I love that. Hire for culture, train for skill. Everyone's trainable, right? If they've got the right culture, they like coming to work every day. The rest is easy. So I love that. You've got that mantra. Mate, let's wrap it up with one thing. Let's give some advice to those who are watching. Um, and I can probably put it into two parts for you because you're at that level. Let's first talk about advice to agents who are sort of at that zero to 100K level at the moment and have the ambition to get to sort of four, five, six hundred K pretty quickly. What what were the big changes for you, do you think, from that shift from zero to five? And then we'll get to, to five to a million a moment. But first and foremost, yeah, zero to five, biggest advice. So the biggest advice for that starting agents, like zero to 500, is build the database, right? Find every way possible, whether it's cold calling. I did a lot of social media competitions, giveaways, just to get the data, right? Because once you've got the data, the next step is nurture it and come up with a system. Everyone's got a different system that works for you and your clientele that'll make them remember you, right? You've got to be there and be available. But I think data for me, the first 12 months really was just get a good database, get it healthy, make sure people want to talk to me, they know who I am and then continue it on from there. That's that's the biggest thing. And, and you know, do things ethically right we were again and i'll keep referring back to the industry the industry has a disgusting reputation um i came from used car sales right and i thought i came to the industry and i was going up the scale and we just found out we've gone back <laughs> down the scale, right so um and i joke about that with my clients all the time but i think that the industry is unfortunately full of unethical behaviors and it's yeah. because two two real estate agents that compete in the same area have this belief that you can't like you can't talk to each other for a start mm. and we win at all cost Right, whether that means saying bad things, whether it means doing incorrect things, you know, that it still happens. Some of the, the the offers and the form sixes that I've seen other agents signing are just terrible, right? They give everyone a bad name. Avoid that, give yourself a good reputation in every part. The rest will flow, right? Because it's easier to build when people know you're good, right? <laughs> That's helpful. For me, the so, step from 500 plus has just been making sure the efficiencies are there and spending your time correctly, right? And that's where the team, you have to have a team member. I, there's no way that you can do a million dollars with just yourself because mm. you need one, you need the social media, you need that professional image online. And, you know, people believe I spend a lot of time on socials and I don't spend any time, right? I'm very lucky. But like to do it, you have to spend the time there or have someone full-time doing it or an agency that can do it for you. Two, you've got to be able to do the paperwork well. The contracts have to be perfect. All these different things come into it. So just get rid of all that. Join a team that either has that in the background that takes care of it all. Yeah. Right? Or get a team that can. And that will be the difference. Because you, when you realize that you've got two, three, four hours extra a day that you can spend prospecting and perfecting your skills and working on processes to make sure that the clients are happy and you're efficient, that will be the difference between 500 and million. That's what I've found. Brilliant. Brilliant. So zero to five, data, 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 build the database and just work like hell, right? I mean, ultimately, I, I agree with that as well in the fact of, I think a lot of people try and fine tune things too, too quickly 
um, without enough data. I think if you've got a big enough database, the, the fight, you're going to miss business in your first couple of years anyway, right? And hopefully when we're talking, when we're giving advice to people who from that zero to 500K, a lot of these people ideally, well, not ideally, but assuming you're in their first um, year, maybe two years of real estate. So don't worry about finessing too much in that time. And I think you probably alluded to that as well. The finessing comes beyond that. The finessing comes from 500K and above and you can't get to a million dollars without that finesse. You need the team members and you need to put them into strict... Um, roles and give them strict responsibilities to make sure everything's um, efficient, effective, uh, professional, all that jazz. And then of course that frees you up then to really nurture the data you've implemented. I think a lot too, too many people as well, and it sounds like you're, you're um, uh, completely against this uh, as, as am I, I think a lot of people look at an assistant to just prospect more business for them, right? But the people forget that you're the person that put the data into the database to begin with. Nathan Simon or the agent is the person that, that, that has that first point of contact. So if, if the assistant or the associate starts calling through these as the first point of contact, you've just wasted all of those contacts going in there to begin with. So I love that. Just to recap, zero to five, data, 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 work like hell and just, just speak to as many people as often as you can. Then from 500 to a mil, really finesse, fine tune, add a team member, find where the weaknesses are, um, Efficiency, effectiveness, professionalism, I think three one three words that, that apply with basically what you've said there. Nathan Simon, very good, my friend. Plenty of key takeaways there. I appreciate your time. Any final comments before we go? No, the only other thing I will say is you're going you're gonna to come across lots of different advice, right? And the more advice you listen to, take little bits because if you implement well, and that's all that matters when you go to training, you'll be fine. Sometimes it can throw you off, right? I made a big change because I went to one training seminar to my whole pitch at the start of this year and I lost every single appraisal oh, for about a month. Wow. Right? And I went back to what was working instantly, right? And I still made some fine tweaks to that, just made it better. But don't, don't like what works for some won't work for you. Find what works for you and just implement what you think helps. Don't have to go in and change everything. Don't reinvent the wheel. Just make sure that you stand out, you stick to your, your morals, and you'll do well. That for me is, is how it ended. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much, my friend. Appreciate it. Thanks, your time. Mate. Good to see you. Awesome.